you can start now. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm very excited about talking um, about this this new work. Uh, just to mention, the, the submission for this workshop uh, is in the scope of a joint work with Eric Bou, Philippe Malbos, and Georg Strutt. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, coherence confluence proofs in modal and cleaning algebras. So just to give you a, an idea of, of what's going to go on, um, this, this work was sort of inspired by uh, formalization of, of uh, rewriting proofs in cleaning algebras. Um, and Philippe Malbos and I uh, have been thinking about how to formalize um, higher dimensional rewriting proofs um, in, in such an algebraic structure. So um, first I'm going to talk about uh, what, what these um, formalizations of, Clini, of rewriting systems in Clini algebra look like, then give you a sort of intuition about what uh, coherence and higher dimensional rewriting uh, what, what that looks like. And then I will introduce this, this uh, algebraic structure, which um, we, we have sort of designed to be capable of expressing um, uh, coherent confluence proofs in an algebraic way. So first, um, let's do something very grounded. Let's talk about a relation algebra on some set X. So this is just the power set of x times x, and we equip it with a addition operation in the form of union, and a multiplication operation in the form of relational composition, for which, of course, the diagonal of x is the unit. Just some notation for a relation, uh, which we denote by an arrow, we will denote by the opposite facing arrow, the converse relation. We surmount it with a star to denote the reflexive transitive closure. And we'll use a double-headed arrow with a star to denote its symmetric reflexive transitive closure. And remember that this is just the sum of these two uh, elements uh, iterated. Now, in this context, uh, abstract rewriting properties can be formulated as inclusions of relations. So for example, confluence, as we saw earlier in, in Vincent van Ostrom's talk, for example, it's expressed as a sort of semi-commutation of the iterated inverse and the iterated relation itself. So here we have the sort of branching shapes. Uh, here we have the confluence shapes. And the inclusion is what's telling us the sort of existential quantifiers on these shapes. That is, for all branchings, there exists some confluence. Similarly, we can express the Church-Rosser theorem as an inclusion, just using the symmetric reflexive transitive closure. <clears throat> so this can be expressed as well in a more abstract setting, namely that of Kleene algebra. So what is this? It's a semi-ring. So this is, uh, we've got a plus and a multiplication. We have all of the ring axioms except for um, an inverse for the addition. We further suppose that addition is idempotent, that is x plus x equal x. Again, think of union. And uh, this allows us to define an order relation on our set K uh, given by this, this uh, equivalence. So we want that X plus Y equal Y for X to be below Y. We also uh, equip it with a map uh, called the Kleene star, which is a sort of generalization of the notion of uh, iteration or of uh, reflexive transitive closure. Uh, so just to give you an idea, um, the unfold axioms are stating basically that it uh, contains the reflexive closure. So we have the unit is underneath x star. And whenever we do an x step followed by an iterated x step, we will still be inside of the iteration of x. We have a similar one on the right. And the induction axioms are a little bit harder to uh, un understand intuitively, I find. But you can see here that we basically have um, a sort of one step uh, in X as our hypothesis over here. And then we get an iterated X step um, in our conclusion. So this is sort of a formalization of induction. Now, what does uh, the Church-Rosser theorem, for example, look like in, in this structure? Well, it's just an equivalence between um, inequalities in this, in this structure. So you can see here, we have the confluence property expressed abstractly. Uh, these are going to be the branching shapes in X and Y. These will represent the confluence shapes in X and Y. 
and the inclusion as before is expressing this quantification. Similarly, the x plus y star will represent the zigzags in x and y, and being below the confluence shapes allows us to conclude that we have the Church-Rosser property. Now, this, uh, the proof of this theorem is really just with internal calculations in the Kleene algebra. And uh, this is what we found interesting about it. And we wanted to sort of um, express higher dimensional rewriting in a similar way. So what does higher dimensional rewriting look like? Um, we're going to use the, the syntax of polygraph. Uh, for those not super familiar with it, the, the intuition is maybe similar to the tiling that we saw this morning. We want to sort of pave uh, confluence diagrams with higher dimensional cells. So for example, if we have this uh, set of higher dimensional cells gamma, we'll say that our polygraph is gamma confluent whenever for every branching, uh, iterated obviously, we can find some confluence and we can fill uh, this, this diagram that we obtain with um, a higher dimensional cell obtained by pasting together elements of gamma. Similarly, similarly, we're gonna say that uh, P is gamma church roster. When for every zigzag F, we can find a confluence and a higher dimensional cell obtained by pasting cells of gamma, which fills this diagram. Now the church roster theorem, the coherent version, what we call it, is going to state that um, when P is gamma confluent, we can conclude that P is gamma church roster. Now, this is sort of the, the usual way that we look at higher dimensional rewriting. That is, we have higher dimensional cells um, going from rewriting paths to rewriting paths. That is, we have sort of horizontal uh, higher dimensional cells. But just to give you an intuition for what we're going to do later on with the n-dimensional Kleene algebras, I'd like to suggest a slightly different approach, which is, uh, and I've called it fillers, for lack of a better word. Um, and it's exactly the same idea, only now we're going to rewrite from the branching shape to the confluence, like we saw in the relational algebra. So the idea is that for every branching, again, we're going to find a confluence. And then we're going to find uh, some cell alpha, which goes now from F inverse composed with G to F prime composed with G prime inverse. So we've just sort of rotated our cells and uh, put, put inverses where we need to in order to make this a globular cell. And actually for symmetry reasons, we're going to have to have another cell alpha prime, which goes from G inverse F to G prime F prime inverse. Um, similarly, we'll say that it's gamma, uh, a gamma church roster filler, sorry, that gamma is a church roster filler for P. If every time we have a zigzag, we can find some confluence, giving us a church roster diagram, which is then filled um, by a higher dimensional cell, which sort of reduces F, the zigzag, to the confluence F prime, G prime inverse. Um, we again get this same result. And really, this is a syntactic difference where we're doing almost exactly the same procedure. We've just changed the, the orientation of the cells. By the way, let me know at any time if you guys have any, any questions. So now that we have... Uh, some idea of the formalization offered by Kleene algebras and the higher dimensional uh, rewriting and coherence. Um, I'll, I'll go straight into talking about the structure that we have defined. Um, so the idea was to find the right axioms, um, to, to have an algebraic structure that deals well with uh, coherent confluence proofs. So I'll try to give intuitions as I go along. Um, and again, let me know if, if you want any um, precisions. So the underlying basic structure that we use is that of n semi-ring. So an idempotent n semi-ring is going to be a set S with an addition operation uh, without inverses and n different multiplications with n different units. Now we want each strata to satisfy the semi-ring axioms. We want the addition to be idempotent, like we saw in, in Kleene algebras. And we again get this natural ordering on our elements. We impose interchange inequalities 
uh, which are going to basically express dependencies between the different multiplications. And uh, you, you may uh, notice a similarity between the interchange law in higher categories. And it is indeed somewhat related, um, but is also found in other places like concurrent cleaning algebra. Um, but we, we have a, a nice intuition of this for higher dimensional cells. If you'd like, I could talk about it at the end. And we also have this last, last axiom, which I call completeness of units. It's basically saying that for i less than j, um, the i multiplication is idempotent for the j unit. The idea is that the, the set of all j dimensional cells is closed under i, um, I composition for i less than j. So just for intuition's sake, we're going to think of elements A and B as sets of higher dimensional cells, okay? Instead of considering them as sets of pairs as we did with the relations, we consider them as sets of higher dimensional cells. Now, we also want an idea of uh, domain in order to further characterize the idea of dimension that we find in, in higher dimensional rewriting. Um, so, we have these maps di for each i between 0 and strictly below n. And we want these to satisfy the domain semi-ring axioms. Um, I won't go into these too much right now. Uh, again, if there are any questions, I can, I can treat them at the end. But basically, these sort of characterize a lifting of the source maps that you get in higher categories to the power set level. So the domain in dimension i of a set of higher dimensional cells a will be the set of all sources of dimension i of the cells in a um, and these these are the minimal axioms for characterizing this this sort of domain operation we also want there to be some uh interaction between the different dimensions so we add this axiom which states that di plus one composed with di gives back di Basically, we're saying that an i-dimensional element can also be considered as an i plus one dimensional element in the following sense. Namely, we call the image of di um, si, the i-dimensional domain algebra of s. And it's sort of the, the idea is that it's a power set algebra in a way of all of the i-dimensional elements. Now, since codomain is sort of a, a dual notion to domain, we can equip the opposite semi-ring, that is the semi-ring in which the order of all the multiplication operations has been inversed uh, with domains. And then the original semi-ring, we call it a codomain semi-ring. So now we have domains and codomains. So the only thing that's left is the Kleene star. So a modal n Kleene algebra will have an underlying idempotent n semi-ring. Um, and we'll have domains and codomains. So we need to have this compatibility criterion between domains and codomains, which basically will state that the domain algebras and the codomain algebras line up. Furthermore, we want each of these star maps to be the um, Kleene star for the corresponding multiplication. So for the I multiplication, we get the Kleene star axioms for the I star. Um, we also, again, need to sort of have an interaction between uh, multiplications and stars of different dimensions. And this will again be for i strictly less than j. We're going to be able to sort of absorb j dimensional elements into the j star and have this inclusion. So whenever I take phi, some j dimensional element, so again, think of it as a set of j dimensional cells, I can basically, what I'm saying is that if I do j composition's of a, and I whisk around the side by phi, it would be the same as whiskering on the side by phi and then doing all of my J compositions. Now, um, since we want globular cells, we also need to add some conditions for globularity. These are expressed here. Um, you'll notice that over here on the left, we basically have the exact globularity conditions that we have for higher categories. Um, that is for I strictly less than J, we absorb um, uh, the dj on the right. And similarly for the range over here. And we'll have a sort of um, homomorphism behavior of the j domain and j range 
uh, J codomain, sorry, with respect to the I multiplication. Now, since we have this globular shape, it's natural to graphically represent our um, our elements in the in this way. So again, think of A as a sort of set of higher dimensional cells, which are going from some J, J dimensional cells in its domain to some J dimensional ce uh, cells in its codomain, which themselves are going between the I dimensional domain and the I dimensional codomain of the same set of cells. So we have this sort of globular character all the way throughout all of the dimensions. Now, these domain and range operations actually give us some useful uh, diamond operators, uh, which act on the j-dimensional um, the j-dimensional uh, domain algebra. So, if I take some element of kj, so some j-dimensional element, um, the forward j diamond of A will act on phi, giving us another j-dimensional element. Namely, we'll take A, we restrict it in its, in its codomain to phi, and then we look at the domain. So basically, we're saying, where do we need to start in order to arrive via an A step in phi? Dually, we have a backward diamond in which we'll restrict um, A to its domain. Uh, we'll restrict A in its domain to phi, and then look at the range. So we're looking where we can go using A steps from phi. And these are, in fact, modal operators on Kj, which forms a distributive lattice under um, J multiplication and addition. So now that we have these uh, diamond operators, we can define a notion of filling. So this is going to be uh, what, what gives us a notion of paving diagrams or filling diagrams. So let's, let's consider a globular uh, modal and cleaning algebra. And again, fix i strictly less than j. <clears throat> now, an i confluence filler for a pair of j dimensional elements will be some a such that its forward j diamond applied to this element is above this element. Now, what does this mean? Notice that we have here um, phi star psi star. Here we have psi star phi star. So again, we see this sort of semi commutation. But of course, we're looking at it through the lens of A. So we're really, uh, it's, it's denoting some kind of transition, right? Unwinding the definition, um, this is merely stating that when we restrict A to these kinds of shapes and then look at the domain, we'll have all of these kinds of shapes. So maybe it's easier if we have a diagram. So again, A will be considered as some higher dimensional cells. We have here, some branching shape in phi and psi. And here we have a confluence shape, psi phi. So what we're saying is that when we restrict A and its range to these kind of shapes, and then look at the domain, we will in fact um, get all of these branching shapes. So really, this, this expresses the fact that for every branching in phi and psi, we will obtain a, we will have an A cell, which, which uh, sends that or sort of paves that branching to a confluence. I don't know if I'm doing on time, yeah. So now that we have this idea of fillers in place, we can state uh, the Church-Rosser theorem. And I'll provide a little proof sketch to show the, the sort of um, expressive power of this of this structure. Um, so if we place ourselves in a globular n modal cleaning algebra again, and we take uh, j dimensional elements phi and psi, and an I confluence filler A, we can actually conclude that we have this inequality. Now again, what does this mean? Uh, we have this A hat star j. So, so what is this? The A hat we're going to take A and multiply on both sides by the zigzags in phi and psi. So in this way, we have sort of all of the, the what we call whiskers, which allow us to do all the comp compositions that we'd like to do. And then we do all of the J compositions that we can. We iterate in the, in the J dimensional composition. 
So now just to make this a little bit more explicit, what does this, uh, this inequality mean? Well, again, uh, just by definition, it means that when we restrict this element in its range, its codomain, to these confluence shapes, and then look at the domain, we're going to capture all of the zigzags. So again, it's, it's saying that all of the zigzags see some confluence through a hat star j steps. And um, yes, by restriction, of course, we have that the range of this element is included in the confluences. So we're really going from these zigzags to the confluences. But again, because of sort of technical reasons, I mean, the, the diamond basically, it's going to scan all future states. So we can't hope to go from the zigzags to the confluences. We have to say, we want to end at a confluence. Do we capture all of the zigzags? So this, this uh, coherent church roster theorem in globular n modal Kleene algebra is, is a sort of correct uh, algebraic interpretation of higher dimensional rewriting. So let's see uh, a quick sketch of the proof. So I'm going to get rid of all the I multiplications because otherwise the notation is quite heavy. Um, basically, we want to prove this inequality, right? And by the left I star induction axiom, we actually see that it's a consequence of this inequality. Here we have our sort of initial conditions. Here we have our one step in phi and psi. Here we have the sort of condition that we need to be verified, and again here. So we'll see in diagrams in just a moment what that corresponds to. Firstly, I'll remark that the one i is uh, below the i stars here, since uh, this is the reflexive i closure, right? And this, in turn, is underneath um, this j star, again, by reflexivity. So we don't need to worry about this, this one i. And um, because of the properties of the order, it therefore suffices just to show this inequality. Now, again, by the same reasoning on the order, we can just distribute out here and prove it for each of the summons. So this corresponds to in the proof of the church roster having um, doing your induction on the length of the zigzag. And then at the end, you know that you either have a positive step or an inverse step. So let's see what that looks like. In the case of phi, this is sort of like the, the, um, the thing that's going to give us the branching, right? Because here we're going to have basically the inductive hypothesis is that we go from some confluence uh, to this zigzag. And then we have this one step phi over here. Well, firstly, we have um, a sort of absorption property of, of the diamonds by this I multiplication which allows us to put this phi inside of the diamond and inside of its argument. So here we'll have this, the, the diamond of this element applied to these, this j-dimensional element. Now here we notice that we have a branching, phi psi. Therefore, I know by my uh, hypothesis that A is an I-confluence filler, that um, this element is below this element. And this corresponds to filling up this branching to a confluence with this A cell. Now I do the same trick of absorbing this phi star into the diamond and into its argument. And then I notice that actually if I do iterated phi steps followed by iterated phi steps, I, oh no, sorry, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so the diamonds, uh, a composition of diamonds gives uh, the diamond of the multiplication. So this corresponds to sort of pasting this cell and this cell along their shared j-dimensional border here. So we've pasted them together along this j-dimensional border. Then now we notice that uh, an iteration of phi steps followed by an iteration of phi steps, of course, gives us just an iteration of phi steps. So now we found our confluence shape here. And now we just have this weird cell in the middle but actually, since um, it's kind of the reason that we whisk on both sides by the zigzags is because now this A hat will actually absorb any whiskers in phi and psi. So we can 
absorb these whiskers and we get an A hat star J composed with an A hat. And of course, this is by definition of the J star uh, underneath the J star of A hat. So now we've, we've proved our first inequality here that we needed to find. And you can see that the, the diagrammatic structure is, is really the same. We can find the same, um, the same structure in the calculation on the left as we see in the diagram on the right. Now for Psi, it's a little bit easier since we just noticed that here we already have a confluence shape. So again, we're going to absorb the Psi into the diamond and into its argument. Next, we notice that a Psi step followed by an iteration of Psi steps will just give us an iteration of Psi steps. And then we again absorb this Psi into the A hat and we obtain the, the conclusion. So um, this is just an illustration of, uh, of one of the proofs that we did using this, this structure. And um, I, hope it, I hope it helped uh, understand a little bit of, of what's going on. Just to conclude, I'd like to say that um, we also have a coherent version of Newman's lemma in, in this kind of structure. We need to add a Boolean structure um, that is, we have a negation on some of the domain algebras. Uh, we also have this uh, hypothesis of continuity by restriction, which is sort of, it's a, it's a very natural thing in a quantile, but here it's a little bit strange. Um, but again, this, this sort of coincides very well with uh, intuitions of, uh, of polygraphs and this kind of thing. Then, because we have actually these, these mo modalities, we can define notions of uh, termination or no th no theoricity and well-foundedness uh, using the diamond operations. And then we can show that if we have a local eye confluence filler, which is defined very similarly to the eye confluence filler, we can conclude that A hat, and this should be a star J, excuse me, the A hat star J is actually a I confluence filler for the same pair. So we're, we're proving that from a local, local filling property uh, for confluence, we can find a global filling property for confluence. Um, our goal in the end would be to uh, provide a similar formalization for Squire's theorem. Uh, of course, uh, Church, Rosser and Newman are sort of um, the ingredients in improving Squire's theorem. Um, we won't, right now, we're not tackling the problem of critical branching lemma because the uh, manipulation of contexts in cleaning algebras is uh, notoriously difficult, but we can prove an abstract Squire's theorem uh, similarly to the abstract uh, coherent Newman's lemma and abstract coherent church rosser theorem. So just to remind you, Squire's theorem is basically saying that whenever I have parallel zigzags, I can, I can fill up the space between them with some higher dimensional cell. So again, our objective is to formulate and prove this, this theorem in the setting of globular modal and cleaning algebras, and hopefully provide an algebraic characterization of cofibrance um, using this result. Thank you very much for your attention, and thanks to the organizers for putting this together despite the <laughs> virtual constraints. Thank you. Okay, Cameron. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, let me see how. Okay, we have uh, one minute. If someone want to uh, ask something to Cameron, uh, otherwise, uh, okay, we can. Uh, move to the coffee break. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, I have a, a question myself uh, and it's uh, related with the formalization of all uh, these uh, results. It was formalized in some uh, uh, theorem prover or? Yes, uh, so that is one um, additional goal would be to um, implement this, this structure in Isabel. So Georg Struth, one of our co-authors, is, is, um, has already done a lot of work implementing um, um, the, the axiom. Algebraic theorem. Sorry? 
implementing uh, algebraic theorems in uh, Kruger system in Isabel, I think. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not uh, hearing very well. All right. Uh, you mentioned one of your co-authors. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, who worked with Isabel? Yes. Yeah, so he's already he, right. he's uh, done a lot of uh, work with this cleaning algebras with domain, which is where these domain mm -hmm. axioms come from, and uh, these have been uh, formalized in in Isabel. And uh, okay. one of the things we'd like to do together uh, now that we've uh, finally uh, submitted the paper mm -hmm. to archive, we can start working on on new things. And we would like to, um, yes, implement this higher dimensional cleaning algebra in Isabel, and um, yes, and and yeah, check everything. Okay, very good, <laughs> very nice. Uh, well, uh, we don't have any other uh, question. 